it is if you think of a bell-shaped curve, mm -hmm. uh, those people um, on, let's say, the right-hand side of the top end, those are the people that would be uh, the highly sensitive people. These are the ones who are most impacted by things that go on in the environment. On uh, getting help, mental health, in some cases, uh, a medical health uh, for these individuals so that they have a shot at normalcy somewhere in their lives. You know, and they're not getting that now. And uh, the burden winds up on the teacher. Personality trait or temperament trait, essentially, that uh, Dr. Elena Ahrens uh, has, uh, I won't say discovered, but I'll say that she labeled it. She was the one who brought attention to it back in the, in the 90s. Um, and there is a lot of misconception about this particular personality trait. A lot of people do think it is a disorder. Hi, this is Sifu Slim, author of The Aging Athlete. In this book, you're going to get to hear about two different groups of former high-performance athletes. One group, which is made up of 90% of the former athletes, does not do physical activity on a regular basis and tends to suffer the consequences of a sedentary lifestyle. The other group, which is made up of 10% of the former athletes, is doing physical activity on a regular basis and tends to thrive through the aging process, or at least has a better chance at coping with the aging process. We could have taken these folks to a lab and done all kinds of tests on them. Instead, we slowed them down and sat them down and asked them in their own words to describe why they are wired the way they are so that we all, former athletes and non-athletes, can use some of their inspirational and motivational and mindset lessons in our own lives. I hope you pick up a copy today. You can go to theagingathlete.com. And when you have a chance to read it, I'd love to hear back from you to find out what your thoughts are on the stories of these aging athletes. Hi there, this is Sifu Slim, and I am really excited today to come to you with a great discussion. And it's about relationships, you know, our relationship with other people in our family, in our work sites, at the local gym, at the local market, wherever we are, the small group meeting. So that's a relationship. And then there's the other relationship that's really important is our relationship to ourselves. We can get bogged down in this very busy world with being productive. And then after being sometimes hyperproductive, we can have to re reset ourselves and disconnect from that busy schedule. So it's not often that we do have the time or we do make the time to connect with other people who have uh, messages for us that we can use in, in terms of getting to know ourselves better, learning how to deal with the inadequacies or the overcompensations that we have, our, our own human uh, anatomy sometimes and our human physiology and our neurology and our psychology. All these things are really important to us. So. I'm delighted today to be able to share a conversation with Bill Allen, and I'm going to ask Bill to come in and give us a little background on himself, some of the studies that he's done, some of the books that he's released, and some of the things that we can go through in our conversation today that we hope that can help people who have HSP, highly sensitive personality. And, um, and, you know, a lot of people have that. And we're going to talk to Bill about the percentages of people who have that, other things in the psychological makeup that relate to that, and then some steps that we can use in order to become more aware and have other people become more aware of our own personal traits in, in, that, uh, in that realm. So, Bill, tell us about yourself. Say hello and tell us about yourself. Hi, Sifu. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me here. Um, as you mentioned, I had written a couple of books on high sensitivity, uh, which is a trait that I've had all of my life. Um, before I started writing about this, I uh, was uh, I worked in the corporate world, uh, worked for a large bank. I was an information technology manager. 
Um, I have a bachelor's degree in, in psychology, which I got many years ago, wound up not applying it directly as I had assumed I would, but uh, used it a lot in my work managing people. Um, I retired about 2010 early. I wanted to get out of that life and I wanted to try something new. Started a small business in Bend, Oregon, where I lived. And it was a hypnotherapy business or a hypno, uh, what I called hypno coaching business uh, that I combined with neurofeedback brain training, which is a really exciting area. Um, and I uh, started a business for a couple of years, had that. I uh, had a family emergency and had to move away from Oregon, uh, close the business down, um, help out a family member. Uh, as, as it turns out, I started writing about, uh, started a blog up about high sensitivities, particularly high sensitivity in men, um, which I thought was an area, of course, of great interest to me because I was a highly sensitive man. But there wasn't a whole lot of material that was out there. Um, and I had read Dr. Elaine Aaron's book years ago uh, in the early 2000s and learned about the trade. Um, and it resonated with me, but I had this problem. And a lot of highly sensitive men have this problem. It was in kind of direct conflict with the masculine narrative that I had been taught all of my life about what a man is supposed to be. So I had this internal struggle about embracing the trait because I felt like some of it didn't sound like it matched up very well with those masculine ideals that I had been brought up with. Um, and so in 2016, I started writing a blog about it. I figured, what the heck? It is what I am. I need to embrace this. And I wanted to find out more. And I started writing the blog. Um, after a couple of years of writing the blog, I had enough material um, and I decided, well, maybe this is time to write a book. I've always wanted to write, always had this sort of a, a bent towards being an author. And uh, I took my material, did some research with it as well. And I wound up writing two book books at one time. One was a kind of a sharing my path on sort of embracing my sensitivity or the personality trait of high, high sensitivity. And the other book was Here's some things that I learned along my journey that helped me uh, uh, come to grips with that and, and ways I've learned to cope with some of the challenges and obstacles sometimes that come up with being highly sensitive. And that's kind of led me to where I am today. I never set out to be kind of an advocate or spokesperson for high sensitivity, but that's kind of what's happened. Um, and it's something I really enjoy and something I enjoy reaching out to and, and especially speaking with other highly sensitive men who are are just now coming um, online, if you will, with their high sensitivity. Uh, and uh, it's just a great and wonderful experience to be able to share it with them. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And, and tell us where you are currently, Bill. I am down just north of Tampa, a little town called Lutz. It's actually just a suburb of the Tampa area. Um, and I'll, I'll probably be here for another six months to a year. And then I'm hoping that I can get back out to Oregon uh, sometime next year where uh, my kids are, my grandkids are. So I'm, Got it. But that's where I am right now. Got it. And um, so I wanted to share one thing about people when they seek help from a friend, from a family member, from a counselor, from a financial counselor, anything. And it's about the idea of trust and being vulnerable. So we're often guarded when in, in our school life. And if we have a bunch of siblings or even one sibling, sometimes we're guarded we have some you know, issues of the other person taking advantage of us or bullying us or telling our secrets, those types of things. So this idea of being vulnerable is something that's often talked about when you go into small group meetings, uh, church meetings, they talk about that, going, being vulnerable and airing what, you know, what's going on in your life. And then when you go into uh, financial or legal uh, counseling, you have to tell them your, your finances, you have to tell them all the commitments you have, the other contracts you've signed. So you have to kind of bear things that are uh, secretive in, in, normal, in our normal walk of life to these counselors. So maybe you can tell me about that notion and how it fits in with someone taking the first step and learning about their HSP, reading, 
reading your book, uh, jotting things down, sharing those thoughts with uh, people who have uh, maybe a caring nature or have some professional background in counseling so that they can help them on that path of awareness and uh, and getting to know themselves and their operating instructions. Yeah, yeah absolutely true. Um, when you get into a sort of a working uh, relationship with somebody, if it's a counselor, a coach, or even a, a, a friend, family member, sometimes when you talk about your most intimate details, um, talking about your feelings particularly, uh, there is uh, a need to have uh, that vulnerability that allows you to be authentic. Uh, you do need to be able to set up a sort of a, a trust bond with them so that they, uh, you know that your information, whatever you're sharing with them is, is in confidence and you can be honest, uh, really is a, the main thing. One thing I've noticed, uh, Sifu, is that the fact that uh, uh, the vulnerability part of this um, is is something that very often comes up uh, when you talk about masculinity, about being a man, is being able to sort of expose that emotional underbelly of who you are to somebody else. And that's really one of the things that I have found uh, even in highly sensitive men who who really are in many ways much more in touch with their emotions simply because we're wired that way, we think more deeply, we yeah. process emotions more deeply, but there's still this reticence about letting go and being vulnerable and sharing these sensitive feelings that you have, especially with other men. And that's one of the things I do is I have an online men's group that meets once a month and we get together with men from frankly, all over the world who are highly sensitive. And one of the first things that we notice um, when highly sensitive men get together is this sort of almost instant rapport and comfort level that they have with each other, regardless of whether they've known each other uh, at a previous meeting or this is their very first time, they feel that ability to be themselves, to be able to let go. And for a lot of those guys, it is a huge relief to be able to say things that they couldn't share with their, maybe some of their male uh, compatriots or maybe even with their family or, um, or, or other people that they may know. And it's just such a relief to be able to do that. So that, yeah, you're absolutely right. That trust is essential. Um, and for highly sensitive men who are trying to express uh, and embrace the trait of high sensitivity, sometimes at the very beginning, it's a little bit, uh, tentative because of that concern about being vulnerable. Yeah, wonderful, Bill. Thanks for bringing all those points uh, out. And I, I'm always interested in the why. And um, I'll share a little bit about my my ancestry coming from Europe and landing on the east northeast uh, corridor. You know, Ellis Island and Plymouth Rock. Amazingly enough, on some one part of my mother's family that that came in the early 1700s. So. These people, when they left Europe, um, they, they come with their religion. They come either from a small village, a suburb, or a, a big city. They come from different socioeconomic classes. They come with different accents. So sometimes there was a Polish person living in Germany, already was ostracized to a certain extent because of their religion or their accent or the fact that they wanted the same job that there wasn't a plentiful, plentiful supply of in, in Germany. So you're even before you get on the boat to come to America, 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, you could have been clobbered by some sort of envy, some sort of hatred, some sort of ostrac ostracizing of your, your background uh, or your, your disposition. So if you're a soft disposition, maybe the person with a stronger disposition had already taken advantage of you. And then you show up in America where, you know, this hopefully land of opportunity, but it, it got filled up uh, very quickly in a very small area like the New York area in New Jersey, some of those areas right there in the right. late 1800s, early 1900s. And now you're in this huge competition. And what I've read about it, and what my parents and grandparents have shared is that there was a lot of there was intermarrying between the, the different ethnicities, but you also had um 
this idea of the Italian neighborhood is here, the German neighborhood is here, and we're going to stick to ourselves. And then on the German side, you have the Catholic Germans, the Lutheran Germans, and so they're sticking together and forming their own their own factions right. and clans. And so these are part of the mechanism that we have to kind of guard ourselves and to form these alliances to, to survive. And then, um, you know, maybe you can bring us up to speed on some of the whys that you think uh, these personality orders or disorders, or whatever the correct word you think uh, we should use for it, how how some of these things came about. Uh, well, first of all, I, high sensitivity is is one thing I want to definitely make sure people understand. It is not a disorder. It is a trait, a temperament trait that occurs roughly twenty to thirty percent of the human population. So it and it's been with us since the beginning of time. In fact, it is a trait that has been exhibited in over a hundred animal species. So it is not something that's just random. It's not something that's that is occurs largely because of environmental factors, like mm -hmm. where someone might have been abused as a child and it, it you know literally rewired their brains or anything like that. Yeah. It is a, a personality trait or temperament trait essentially, that uh, Dr. Elena Ahrens uh, has, uh, I won't say discovered, but I'll say that she labeled it. She was the one who brought attention to it back in the, in the 90s. Um, and there is a lot of misconception about this particular personality trait. A lot of people do think it is a disorder. And even those people who have it, who don't understand the trait very well because they haven't educated themselves about it, Will sometimes think that they've got some kind of problem there. Um, so just to make that distinction, the, the high sensitivity, or as it's called, sensory processing sensitivity, is is definitely not a disorder. Um, one of the things, though, that highly sensitive people can learn to do is ameliorate some of the things that are challenging about the trait. For example, we have a tendency to get overwhelmed a lot with sensory information, right? Things that are coming in from all over the place. And we have this ability to pick up things a lot of people don't catch, right? Um, I, it isn't because sensory organs are better or anything like that. What it amounts to is a, a filtering mechanism that allows us to put attention on things so that we, you know, because we get bombarded constantly by sensory data is what, I think in highly sensitive people is a little bit more wide open. If you think about an aperture on a camera, mm -hmm. it's like it's a little bit more wide open and we're getting more information in. Mm -hmm. And you couple that with another characteristic of highly sensitive people, which is this ability to process information a very deep level. That means really taking it down deep and churning it, processing it over and over again, seeing it from a million different ways. Um, and those two things together alone this deep processing of information and the ability to pull more information in can be overwhelming sometimes because mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of you know information to have to deal with. Uh, but it does provide us with some really great outputs, and that could be creativity, uh, seeing things in a different way that other people don't see. Um, and as you were mentioning before, the fact that when you, you look at a melting pot like New York, uh, that area has been traditionally the entry point into the United States for, 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 since the country began, that what happens is you get a lot of people thrown together in one place at one time, and they're all coming in with different aspects. What's interesting about that, and I've learned this is since I've been studying this and looking into it, is that this trait, this particular trait, um, it's too bad it wasn't back during the heyday of Ellis Island or 1900s, early 1900s, uh, was it no more of is that one of the commonalities across all ethnicities, all cultures, all people, male or female, uh, this trait uh, exists in about 20 to 30 percent of those populations. So there is a commonality factor that goes across the entire human genome where uh, 20 to 30 percent of the population uh, is likely to have this. That's two to three people out of 10 wow. have, have this Thing. So it's not uncommon, but it's certainly not in the majority. Yeah. Um, but it does affect how people process things. It affects how they emotionally process things and how they see things in the, in the environment around them. 
Yeah, the um, one of the things that I was uh, sharing about our backgrounds, uh, you you definitely um, clued me in correctly that it's a personality trait that has a lot of beneficial things. One of the things that I guess uh, I brought up the why is if you have the HSP personality trait and you are sensitive and you and you take things into your cellular level uh, in terms of pain or worry or people distrusting you, whatever the, the accusation or the reaction is from that other person, it can hit you harder and it can last longer in my estimation if you are a HSP. And so maybe you could you could share that part. Yeah, that, that's it, it's very interesting because I've written a few blog articles recently about that. Uh, it does. It does hit us uh, harder. And one of the criticisms, if you will, of highly sensitive people that come from people who are not highly sensitive is the idea that we are too sensitive to criticism or, or, or sort of this fear of rejection kind of thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things about highly sensitive people, I think, is a high level, a high degree of conscientiousness. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when we put our foot forward to do something. Uh, we want to do it right. We want it to, to be something that's acceptable, not only to ourselves, but to the outside world. And very often that leads to things like perfectionism, you know, and, and that in and of itself can be a problem for anybody and not necessarily highly sensitive people. But yeah, that's true that, that we do let these things uh, sometimes sit too deeply within us. Yeah. Uh, we start questioning ourselves. What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? Uh, that kind of thing leads to things like rumination. It leads to things like worry. Uh, and those things are some of the challenges that highly sensitive people have to deal with is this. We are most highly sensitive people are introverts. About 70 percent are introverts and about 30 are extroverts. But because many of us are introverts, you know, our world is inside of us. It's not outside of us. It's inside of us. So consequently, when you are testing an idea that, say, somebody said something to you that you felt was critical, and you're testing it internally, and you're not validating it externally, yeah. what happens is you believe that what conclusion that you have drawn is correct when it may not be correct, not in an outside world test kind of way. So there is that tendency to take that criticism to heart and uh, it, it could very often sort of stymie the growth of a highly sensitive person if they take that, uh, cri take criticism that way all the time. Uh, so yeah, it is a problem. It can be a problem. Okay. I, um, I appreciate that, Bill. I, I jotted down two uh, phrases that's one sentence here and I'll, and I'll run it by you. And it's sort of a hard hitting way of me looking back at the interactions that I've had with other people where it it may not have gone right in a specific instance or it might have not gone right repeatedly in a relationship with uh, with another person. So here's what uh, what I'm going to share and maybe you could uh, you can okay. walk walk uh, walk some of these things through uh, after I say um hi I'm an honest deep caring person and I'm a truth seeker. So please believe that my intentions are, are honorable and please do not take it adv advantage of me and do not use violent communication with me. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a person who is, is sharing honestly what boundaries are for them. These are my boundaries. This yeah. is a problem that highly sensitive people have because Sometimes we're just too nice and yeah. we don't want to say, uh, you know, if you if you go there, you're going to violate a boundary of mine or you're going to tread into an area where I'm going to be very uncomfortable. And it's sometimes very difficult for some people who don't easily see where other people other people's boundaries are yeah. uh, and, and talking with especially a highly sensitive person that they'll maybe unconsciously broach those boundaries mm -hmm. and you have to give them feedback uh, about the fact that they've done that. I think a lot of times highly sensitive people will just take it and not say anything about it. And 
we'll, we'll go back, you know, after the conversation and ruminate about what happened, what they could have and should have done. But what you just did was say, basically, uh, this is who I am. And these are my boundaries. And boundaries don't mean you can't communicate with somebody. Yeah. But there are things that I think that we all need to set up to say, you know, this is going a little, this is going too far with me. You're going over into an area that I'm very uncomfortable with. And people mm -hmm. should know that. You should be able to share that with people. So mm -hmm. I applaud you for that introduction uh, <laughs> for, to, to, to when you're talking to somebody, because frankly, you're just laying out the lay of the land and saying, look, this is this is an area, you know, this is who I am, this is what I am, and it is very vulnerable, but yet you also say, hey, and these are some of the boundaries in communicating with me that I want you to observe. Yeah, I, um, I'm thinking back to other times when I wished people I was interacting with or forming relationships with, or, uh, you know, we knew each other for, for years before we knew about uh, personal psychology and in any uh, extended way. I hadn't read much on it by the time I was 20. And so now I'm looking back at people with whom I had these relationships. I wish I would have known their boundaries, um, yes. their their proclivities, the things that put them at, 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 at a dis-ease uh, standpoint. And then I could have operated uh, those under those uh, constrictions, which I think is a good word because you want to constrain yourself from overstepping a, a boundary and making right. someone horribly uncomfortable. That's no good uh, taking advantage of them. And especially as a person who I would say that I'm a protector of people. So I could be I could step into the alpha role if someone was being taken advantage of. But I'm not I don't operate from the standpoint of getting up in the morning as an alpha thinking of, you know, sort of a dominant personality, Wh whom am I going to dominate today or who am I going to aggress? And I'm not saying all the alpha males are bad, but that's, uh, in my opinion, part of how they're wired. I mean, they wind up being captains of industry, directors of certain, certain things. And there's also a known statistic that there are a lot of people with narcissism, that uh, tendencies that wind up being the heads of things. So, Maybe I'll, I'll shush for a minute and, and let you weigh in on some of these things. Yeah, let me, I, I would love to talk about that for a second, because um, I, I I think when you said alpha male, that, that really is something is really something that's embedded, especially in American culture, is this yeah. idea of the alpha male. Yeah. Uh, but it's it, it's an unfortunately kind of a corruption of a concept that was de designed or developed after observing wolves. And the idea was that... that it got translated as the dominant wolf in the hierarchy of a, a pack uh, is this uh, sort of, I eat first, I do everything first, I take what I want, get what I want. Um, and we've kind of personified that to kind of fit into a mold that we feel that a certain way that men are supposed to be, that is dominant, aggressive, uh, you know, pushing forward and so forth and so on, uh, sometimes, stepping over people uh and that that really to me the alpha actually is and especially in a wolf pack i may not be true in all animal groupings but they actually look after everybody they're the the nurturing individual they may be dominant in size or for some other reason uh that they become the alpha but they are they take on a very nurturing role within the, the community and they eat last. They make sure everybody's taken care of. They watch after the young from a back position as they move forward and they're going from place to place. So I, I think with alphas uh, and the fact that we put so much uh, primacy on the, the alpha male ide ideology is more a tie in, I think, than anything else to this this uh, system of masculine ideals that we have created in our culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but let me get back to a, something you said a minute ago. Um, sensitivity is actually a spectrum, okay? It is, it is if you think of a bell-shaped curve, mm -hmm. uh, those people um, on, let's say, the right-hand side of the top end, those are the people that would be uh, the, the highly sensitive people. These are the ones who are most impacted by things that go on in the environment. As you move up 
the curb to the middle, great big middle where most people are, uh, there is a sort of a moderate level of sensitivity there. They, they have some of the capabilities that highly sensitive people have, but for the most part, uh, go from sort of maybe low high sensitive to, to sort of low, low sensitive. On the very bottom of the curve, the other side, and this, there's no value assignment here, okay? But on the other side is people who have less sensitivity. And they, and they are those who are less impacted by environmental changes. So they don't get so worked up about things. They're also those people who like to take risk. They take no. chances. No. And um, so I, I look at that as a sort of a con in context that it is a spectrum. And that both sides are needed. We need cautious, thoughtful, nurturing, intuitive type people like the highly sensitive people are. Again, I'm not adding a value judgment to that. I'm just saying that's sort of the, some of the characteristics that are presented. We also need those people on the other end who are less impacted by criticism or less impacted by uh, environmental factors or emotional factors and can take things forward. They can take those risks that we need to keep the human species growing and so forth. So you need that balance between those two things. So you're right. There are those people that, um, and probably if I was going to say narcissistic individuals would probably hover down towards the other end, because one of the things that narcissism is, is that it has is a lack of empathy for other people. Yeah. And, and that's really kind of the opposite of what highly sensitive people are about. Um, but Point again is that the idea is it is a spectrum. Sensitivity is uh, in everybody. Everybody's sensitive to a degree or another. You couldn't exist without it. Um, but highly sensitive people tend to be more, as I said, thoughtful, cautious, and they tend to be the ones, as Dr. Aaron says, are the priestly advisors. They're the ones who give the cautionary note. They're the ones who say, let's don't drive the bus off the cliff because that's not a good idea right now. Um, and we need highly sensitive people, especially right now, as much as we need those people who drive things forward and keep us growing a, a, as a species. So uh, it's all about that kind of balance, I think, that comes uh, out of that and understanding that there is a spectrum to this. And it's not just high sensitive people and everybody else. Uh, that's something I, I want to make sure it was clear. Sure, sure. Yeah, the idea of of uh, us, Bill, um, complementing each other. So if we're in a tribe of people, uh, just like the the pack of uh, the the pride of lions, you have uh, the ones who are excellent hunters. You have the ones who are excellent in the child care. Uh, the ones that might think a little bit ahead of the other pack when there's a problem coming or how to find water. There's all these different roles in a pride of lions, in a in a group of Ogallala Sioux. In the 1700s, same thing. You had some hunters, you had an empathetic medicine person, usually a medicine man, but sometimes a woman. You had the political leader who had to confer, hopefully, and, and, and set up some sort of arrangements and agreements with a medicine person. Oftentimes, the medicine person was the one who said, where we're going to go in the springtime, where we're going to go in the fall. And they would you know, do ceremonies with, with smoke and with stars and with chants and all these things to try to help the tribe be part of that decision making and you know seeking the universe to lead them in some way and then the medicine person could be the healing person when someone had a sprained ankle or a cut on their leg or a relationship that was not working maybe father and son they could go sit with that medicine person individually or together and that medicine person could sit down and provide them with uh, with some hopeful solutions or things to think about and some rules of the road, as it were. So those are some of the things that I think are very helpful that we're not in opposition with these people with different personality traits. We're actually supposed to complement each other. But what I think happened in societies that are just functional, and I would call a lot of the post, uh, starting with the agrarian revolution, whether it's 10 or 14,000 years ago, when you move from hunting and gathering to that, then you had ownership of land. And then that meant ownership of men, of women. And right. uh, and then the man being able to do whatever he wanted and hire guards. And, and, and now to fast forward through the farm, the people ownership of that, to the people owning the industry, 
And then you can also attempt to own the court system and the government and however else, uh, you know, what other system that's around you that can provide you with work and provide you with protection and future work and all these types of things. So maybe walk us through on uh, this idea, Bill, on complementary living, cooperative living versus the survival, and the fear-based mentality, which I think m may prevail uh, in, in the last 15,000 years. Well, let me let me just say this, Sifu. I totally agree with everything you just said. I've been doing a lot. Of, I'm actually working on a book on masculinity right now, and I've been go researching the history of masculinity. And there does seem to be a huge pivot point that occurred during the agrarian revolution, if you will. As soon as people became uh, stopped being nomadic and settled, and the opportunities for accumulating wealth occurred. You had a completely sea change difference in how men and women related to each other and how people related to, say, property or nature, if you will, that was around them. Um, and I definitely agree with you on that, that that, that was a, a, a definitely mindset change that occurred. Um, and I think when I talk about masculinity, and this is go, goes to that balance we talked about, that masculinity um, is... And I sometimes describe it in kind of pejorative terms, and a lot of people are offended by it, especially men, because they think that I'm attacking men. But my 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 point is that masculinity is a social construct. It's not something you're born with. You are taught what masculine means as you grow up. And what's happened is that this this sort of masculine mentality that we've had, uh, where the men is man is described as being dominant, as created this rift between women and men uh, over the centuries and has caused an imbalance in our relationship with each other. And it also has put men in a position in which they're being deprived of being able to be fully human, right? And being fully human means being able to express all of these other characteristics that we have sort of bucketed over into the female uh, bucket things like nurturing and being intuitive and being empathetic and being caring um, uh, and, and saying that those are kind of things that men don't do and that only women do. And unfortunately, um, you know, it's depriving men of certain aspects of themselves that they need, that we need to be able to be in touch with our emotions. We need to be able to express the vul vulnerability that you talked about earlier. That's one of the one of the main problems today. I think I see in masculinity. I see this all over the world. Is this idea that men can't be vulnerable, and if they can't be vulnerable, they can't seek help when they need it, and that's definitely throwing men kind of out of balance. Um, but back to your the idea of that why we need the balance in, in in terms of sensitivity, which is just one aspect, right? We need balance in everything, and I think nature abhors imbalances. Uh, there is a beautiful balance that nature has uh, unless something goes awry where something, an outside force or whatever, starts to mess around with that. And I think the, the what we talked about it, um, the high sensitivity is being called an evolutionary quality, not only by Dr. Aaron, but also by uh, other researchers who are doing this as well, that this is a quality that's baked in by nature to help create that balance. Because I think we largely see human beings as being somewhat aggressive, especially males, aggressive, pushing forward, uh, sometimes not being as thoughtful and cautious and careful as they should be. Um, and there needs to be a counterbalance to that. And I think highly sensitive people can offer that. Um, they're, they're not competing. They're cooperating with each other. That's one of the things that I think because of the agrarian revolution, it's created this sort of uber competitiveness amongst groups, right? Where you have one nation versus this nation or this group versus this group, which goes back to your, you know, uh, reference to the Ellis Island and the immigration policy of different groups coming in, marking territory, being, you know, in isolation from each other. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things that highly sensitive people who are much more cooperative and prefer cooperation over competitiveness 
are going to be very useful, especially down the road, is, is more highly sensitive people have become aware of the trait, they've come to embrace the trait, they can model the trait for other people, and we can maybe start moving towards this more cooperative idea that we are all here together as human beings, and we need everybody uh, on deck, especially right now. Thanks, Bill, for sharing that. I, um, I'm thinking back to some thoughts that I had before I knew I was HSP uh, working in uh, public education. So let's just take a high school, for example, okay. two, 2000 some kids, all kinds of ethnicities, lots of single parents, uh, criminal um, backgrounds in some of the families. Uh, sometimes the kids themselves, I, I had kids in my class that had an ankle brace, very friendly kids but they told me that uh, they just had an out of control life and they got they got arrested for doing x y or z but they were not uh, you know to be jailed at age 16 or 17 they just right. wanted to track them so that they couldn't go back to that group of people or that place that where they were causing a causing a, a criminal situation so i i saw all these things and then i thought about the teachers and the staff who were involved with you know, educating these kids and keeping them safe, keeping them in line during the uh, six to eight hours per day at the public school. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we had extra people who could come in, sometimes just to replace a teacher for an hour? So the teacher is in a heightened state of emotion, something happened in their private life before school, or it was an ongoing thing, like a kid, uh, their own kid may have had cancer or something like this. And then they, you know, they're a little bit uh, disrupted by that and maybe in a slightly weakened state or discombobulated state. And then they've got to deal with one or 20 kids that particular day who they themselves, those kids, have their own issues and maybe projecting that behavior, that dissatisfaction, that anger, the fear, what have you, in the classroom setting. And so the teacher is really in this heightened state of emotion which could be an internal crumbling, or it could be an expression of, of anger or fear or what, what have you. Wouldn't it be nice if we had someone who could just walk in and assist or replace that, that person for an hour so that they could go regroup, make a phone call, sit down, do a, a, a recite a few mantras of something, have a, a lunch, whatever it, it is. But we often ask people that are high performance people, who isn't in the modern era, it's so competitive, it seems like once you're making a certain amount of money, who is in high performance? We ask them to maintain that high performance for 35 years with no slip ups. And if there's a slip up, they don't go from A plus or A to A minus or B plus. We've dropped them to F and we almost character assassinate them and don't, you know, don't give them a good job reference for the future because of one slip up that might have lasted 15 seconds or 15 minutes. And that's what we do to do people in this this busy world uh, with high liability. Maybe Bill, if you could share share your thoughts on that. Well, you know there are a lot of people out there, especially a lot of retired people, um, that could help serve as a kind of uh, working in the school systems, helping. Uh, for some reason, we don't put a premium on uh, doing things like that, kind of volunteer to help, especially young people. As you're talking about that, I, get, I just keep seeing these images of especially young men who have come from very difficult home backgrounds. Uh, maybe they were abused. Uh, maybe they had an abusive parent. Uh, maybe they've witnessed things in their lives that, that you know, are life altering. And, and they go into the school system uh, and they're carrying all that baggage with them. And they don't know what to do with it because nobody's ever taught them or nobody's uh, taught them what to do in, in controlling emotion, emotional regulation, or more importantly, how to deal with the troubles that they've had. And that would be mental health therapy. Uh, we just don't put a premium on that. That really bothers me that, that we can, you know, we can put more emphasis on how much uh, Microsoft makes or uh, Tesla makes that, that's more important than a, a child uh, growing up who could very well be contributing to society in, in, in a much more meaningful way. Um, 
I do agree. I, I, I right now, especially now uh, for teachers, I think uh, they have a very difficult. Uh, they're in a very difficult position uh, for a lot of political reasons uh, that aren't uh, their control. Uh, they're underfunded, they're underpaid, and you're right, they're understaffed. Um, and I think that's something that that I think collectively, I can only speak about, of course, the United States, because this is where I live, and, and um, that we need to put more emphasis on how we raise our children and how we are all there for our children, right? Um, that means that when we're raising the future generation collectively, we should tap into all the resources that are available. Somewhere back in the 80s, I had read a newsletter somebody had put out. I can't remember who it was. I wish I could quote the, the lady who, who came up with this idea. But the idea of using, as I said, uh, senior citizens who are may not be doing anything meaningful yeah. in their life at this point, I'm not saying they aren't, but many of them don't, would like to get involved in some way uh, and be able to be utilized for their experience, their knowledge, their background. Um, they've got a lot of things that they can bring to the table and things that they can share, make connections with uh, with younger people. Uh, but I, I, I think the main thing that I would say here is that, that and this is something that's very true for men, and boys, is that we don't put enough emphasis on uh, getting help, mental health, in some cases, uh, a medical help uh, for these individuals so that they have a shot at normalcy somewhere in their lives, you know, and they're not getting that now. And uh, the burden winds up on the teacher. Uh, they're the, often the ones who have to not only deal with the misbehavior, and in some cases, as we have seen lately, that they are putting their lives on the line to teach kids. Yeah, I wanted to uh, also um, explain that I just picked teachers as, a, as an example. You could pick any busy person. You could pick a forklift operator who, who works for a union or a non-union. And they're asked to do this very dangerous job of moving these high pallets or heavy objects around where things could tip the whole forklift over and cause an accident and hurt the person and hurt other people around there. And that person's under pressure to get all of that product to the, you know, out of the warehouse, if they're in a warehouse, into the truck in a safe way, or at the job site. And job sites are constantly in flux. They could have had rain, so right. now there's mud, and the mud is disrupting the foundation of the thing that they're they're driving on. So all, any job, a police officer, you could pick any job. You know, a pilot. Here's a really good story uh, for you, and I, I hope this will entertain the audience. I have a friend whose father was a pilot, and at the time, he you know he did the Berlin airlift uh, back in the in the late 40s, I believe it was and uh, maybe 49. And then uh, he also was a pilot for Jap Japan Airlines. He was a bomber pilot, originally transports and now uh, transporting passengers for a, a, a normal corporate airline. And in Japan, they have that whole notion of your honor and um, you know the ancient samurai is not to admit certain things, their weaknesses, their fears, et cetera. And they, they can even commit harikari by killing themselves with a with a sword, boy, I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so I don't know how many people could, but yeah. imagine, that, imagine that. I don't think I, you know, removing a splinter I could do. And I guess if I was dying, I could probably put stitches into myself to keep myself from dying. But I don't think I could take a sword and end my life for a dishonor or something, some reason. And so this person was, uh, he had a co-pilot and a navigator, so three people. And he's a Caucasian person with two Japanese people. And the Jap Japanese uh, second in command, the uh, co-pilot said, hey, I'd like to take off and land the plane today. And they're in, J in Japan, I believe. And so he uh, he did take off and uh, he did land. He was about to land the plane. And my friend's father, I think this was back in the 70s, looked over at him and he saw the person was sweating and nervous and not making the right pre-landing adjustments to the control board. And he and he he very calmly told the person, I've got it. I'm here. And he just took over the controls. But that person wasn't about to, in his opinion, 
uh, wasn't about to tell them that he had anxiety or fear about that landing. He was going to try his best to land that plane, even though he was he was making mistakes. And so the father learned a valuable lesson about, you know, honor from the, the Japanese standpoint and being vulnerable, which uh, this person wasn't trained in. This Japanese person wasn't trained in being vulnerable. I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Yeah, that's another example. I, you know, that uh, that mentality of not being vulnerable or not admitting that you can't do something um, is something that's permeated, I think, across men, particularly um, uh, around the world in many cultures, where it's dishonorable to not know what you're supposed to know and not ask for help. Um, and to me, that's that's a huge problem um, because yes, we learn by doing things, and yes, we learn from our mistakes. Uh, but in certain circumstances, especially when you're flying a plane like that, where you've got other people's lives on the line as well, uh, you want to be sure to be able to do that, be able to ask for that. But in a, in cultures where men are not supposed to be vulnerable, they're they're supposed to know everything. Um, and the expectation is, you know, failure is not an option. Um, that tendency uh, can be not only dangerous to other people, but it's also very dangerous um, from a health perspective to the individual. Yeah. Not being able to be vulnerable and say, look, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can I get some help here? Um you know, we put a premium on that here, even especially in America. Uh, a lot of men will not ever admit they need to go to a doctor until the day the doctor says you have six weeks to live, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, because you didn't come in here a year ago. You didn't do your colonoscopy like I told you to. And now, you know, your life is on the line because you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. It's that stoic warrior mentality. And again, going back to the, the spectrum and going back that we need all types to, to make the world what it is. We need warriors in the world, I assume. Would be nice that they were uh, always on standby and never having to go to battle, but that there, there's a, a need for that kind of protectionism that we all have to have as well. But as well as there is a need for those people who are more or less uh, the sort of the advisor, priestly, cautious people, as well, we need that as as part of the whole spectrum and balance that nature's provided for us to survive with. Um, I just wish men would learn that you're not innately born uh, to be a man in the terms that we've described in, in masculinity. You're not innately born that way. You learn that over time, and if it's something you learn and it's a social construct, then we can modify that we can change that and we can say to little boys as they're growing up it's okay to cry it's okay to be vulnerable you know and to be able to admit that you can't do something uh, it's just being human wonderful i um as you were saying that i, I was thinking about the athletes I've interviewed, you may have seen some of the, my material on athletes, but I, I've done a study and I call it the, the Aging Athlete Project. And aging doesn't mean that you're an old athlete. You, you could be a, an 80 or 90 year old athlete, um, but we're all aging from the time that right. we're born. And so uh, what I looked at is the difference in physicality and how that physicality translates to wellness and mind, body, and spirit, and drive for living and motivation, all these types of things through the course of this person's life. And so what I found, uh, and this is two, I'm up to 2000 interviews in, in May of 2023, where we sit uh, with these uh, current or former athletes and their coaches and the sports psychologists, all, all of the related parties, family members, husbands or wives, all this type of thing, is that more than 90% of the high-performance physical people, so industrial athletes like general contractors, military personnel, military athletes, Broadway dancers, U.S. postal workers or any postal worker around the world, landscapers, et cetera, they're all athletic people who use their physicality for uh, their livelihood at, at some point during their life. And what I found 
on the physicality is the day that they leave that highly performance thing. And that's high school, college, or pro sports. That's in your, and after you leave the military, let's say you're in there for two years from age 20 to 22. Uh, you're a landscaper and, or a plumber and you work till you're 65. So the day that you leave that high performance physical demand that you've, that you've undertaken for all these years, 90% uh, of these people become mostly sedentary. That means they have no plan for physical maintenance or joy in right. movement or yoga or croquet or ping pong, anything physical except for loading the groceries and going to the refrigerator and moving the couch if you have to do a carpet cleaning. These people are not wired for maintenance, joy and movement, wellness, yoga, Jack LaLanne. They're not wired for that. They're, they were went through a period of high performance and they did that and they accomplished that goal. And now they move on to un, uh, something else, which could be an ex-athlete becoming a super mom or super dad becoming, uh, you know, putting it all into their their kids, let's say. They could be uh, do the same thing with the work. They open up a sports bar or they become a teacher and they work all the time or they become a couch potato and, and go to the microwave from time to time. So that's what I found that happens to these 90% uh, of these people. And so I'm trying to bring awareness in my work to the young people and to the coaches and teach young people about maintenance, recreation, joy and movement not just the high performance and the, and the needs of the team or of the sport that they're in. Maybe you could weigh in on that if you would, Bill. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. I, I, um, I saw something the other day, so sort of confirms, I guess, some of that. What you're talking about is that a lot of high performance athletes don't live very long lives. Um, you would think because of all the emphasis on, on this physical uh, exercise and performing uh, and movement and so forth physically that they would carry forward, you know, and, and through the rest of their lives, but apparently uh, they don't. And um, they have, uh, like I said, I don't know if this is a study, it was just some observational thing, but pointed out life expectancy for some of these folks is not hundred years old or 80 or 90. They, they wind up, we uh, departing uh, this life much earlier. So, uh, and I agree with you. I That's another thing I, I think is really important is that we stress with our young people uh, while they're young, the importance of doing uh, activities that exercise the body. Uh, and this is something I can tie into highly sensitive people as well. One of the things that when we talk about overwhelm and being, uh, uh, you know, too much uh, overstimulated by things. One of the things that high sensitive people naturally do, but sometimes have to be encouraged to do is to get out in nature, go take a hike, go for a walk or a run, uh, or just be still and be out in nature, observe and breathe and whatever. In order to get to that place, of course, you have to be in good enough shape to be able to walk there and come back uh, or do get engaged in some exercise uh, or some like I think of uh, meditation and motion like Tai Chi or some kind of yoga practice or something like that, that not only uh, ex exercises you, uh, but it's good for the mind too. Uh, doing Tai Chi is not something you just pick up and, it, you know, it, the movements are all in your head automatically. Very To make it look as effortless as, as it, it does look when you're in a park somewhere and you see 60 people that are all gathered together doing a Tai Chi form together uh, is the idea that it's a mental exercise as well. Um, and so those things working in concert are very important for our total health for people uh, is to stay active, uh, to stay in motion, and to keep that going for the rest of your life. It's not that you don't retire from life. Uh, when you leave your job, you, you still need to carry on and some of those things that sustain you. Thanks, Bill. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify is I think I said the word leg brace. I meant to say the word ankle or, or ankle brace. I think I said, I think I, I wanted to say ankle collar on the okay. student, a student in high school so that they had a thing they couldn't remove. And it had a beeper where uh, the law enforcement could track that person. So right. that's one thing I wanted to clarify. 
And uh, another thing I wanted to clarify is these athletes whom I've interviewed, and I and I also participated in sports and martial arts and long distance running with many of these, what I would call pushers. And so pushers are people who are willing to push the limit of safety for the uh, for the win or the performance and gymnastics, those types of things. And they they could do it when they're injured, let's say. And some many of the athletes I interviewed for my book that were high performance athletes had four or five injuries. And some of them in their 40s had already had 10 surgeries, you know, metal plates and and bars and titanium in their in their system. Uh, so these types of things. So th that's the person I'm calling a pusher, uh, not just high performance and functional, but a high performance functional. Now they're a pusher, which means they're willing to break their neck almost for that um, for the excellence that they're trying to achieve, whether it's paid or unpaid. And this goes back the same thing to the hunter gatherers, the ones that were really uh, good at, at hunting and warfare oftentimes were the ones that would risk it all. So let's say a hunting and gathering back to the Ogallala Sioux, he's all alone on a hunt and there's the tribe of crow people uh, whom this person may have done some damage to in the prior weeks right. or months or years. Now there's three crow natives coming after him and rather than uh, turn his tail and run, he may decide to fight it out and wind up disabled or dead or tortured and then dead. And so these are some of the traits in these pushers that are recurrent. And you see that in 2023 and we'll see that forevermore because that's the way these people, some of them are wired. Now, maybe you could share some thoughts on that, Bill. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were saying that, that I think there are some people that are wired that way. Um, and um uh, you know, it, it's interesting. There is a there is a segment of the high, uh, highly sensitive people called high sensation seeking individuals, um, and they're not necessarily in, in, under the HSP umbrella. Uh, people who are going to go jump off a, a bridge in New Zealand and bungee jump, but they're looking for novel experiences, and they're sometimes are very much pushing the limits that they have, uh, physical limits they have, in order to get that sort of uh, experience of trying something novel and new. And so they push things. But I'll, I'm wondering, Sifu, if, if, if in your discussions with any of these athletes, and I assume that many of them were male, um, did they ever say anything that this was an expectation that was handed to me about doing, not just performing, but, you know, performing above and beyond and also putting themselves in harm's way in order to take one for the team or to, to get that last goal scored or whatever, uh, even if it meant harm to themselves. There, there is a, a rule that dates back until, you know, humankind, which, which says that if you take the role of the person everyone's depending on for that particular activity, that you you just have to do it, rain, shine, hail, uh, op opposition forces, what have you. That's your job, and we see that borne out in the ancient Spartans, and we and that's where I I traced them in, in my book, The Aging Athlete, and also in my book, Sedentary Nation, which talks about the fact that all of our great grandparents were physical. Even Ebenezer Scrooge, who was an accountant. He had to walk to his office every day. He had to walk upstairs. He had to right. buy a sack of potatoes. So even the accountants, if you go back to the uh, 1800s, you know, they're not sedentary. But uh, most of our great grandparents and grandparents were very physical for their daily living needs. You know, the grandmother with a bucket with a kid under one arm and a bucket on the other is is very common in our in our thinking about uh, about their lifestyle. So. These athletes um, grew into that. So I, I traced the Spartans to the, the warriors. And so the first education uh, that I've been able to find uh, in a non-tribal setting in some sort of an organized village sedentary group was, uh, was church. So you have people learning a faith, they're sitting. Uh, after that, or concurrent to that, you have military training. So in the Spartans case, it was on a field. So whether you had 
20 people or 40 or 300 if they had a, a some sort of a, a, a what, what are those megaphone type of a thing uh, they right. could do the teaching there and then break it uh, break it down to the officers in charge of the of the smaller group so you find this ethic this ethos of following the protocol from the higher ups and it's passed down and you're expected to it in the case of the spartans there's a a, a piece of mythology and, and literature that says either come home with the sword or come home on the sword. That means your mother, when you leave at age 19 to, to go train or fight in battle as an ancient right. Spartan, you're going to come back with your sword, with marks from the other people's swords and hammers, or you're going to come back dead on your sword, and then they, your parents uh, get to bury you. So this is what I find invariably. Uh, I, I, I think that young people at age 10 or age 15 know that that's what's expected of them if they're on a sports team or a martial arts or what have you. And when a kid breaks down and cries and wants to go home, uh, I've seen it countless times in my life that they're looked down upon by the school and sometimes their parents and their siblings and their and their friends from having a quote unquote wimped out in this uh, in this test that they face that particular day. So I'll, I'll end that little piece on that and let you chime in. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, right. It, but a lot of that stuff is cultural, right? It's the culture you live in. Even in Sparta, that was the cultural expectation that, you know, it was a warrior society. I mean, that's what they, that, that's what they did. That was their business, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and, and they supported it and they were good at what they did because of the discipline they had that was devoted to uh, making war. Yeah. Um, uh, in our culture, we carry a lot of that warrior mentality, I think, um, you know, from the various European cultures that came across and settled here and mm -hmm. sort of set the tone for how we do things. Um, and that trickles down all the way down to athletics, which is, in many ways, is our, our gladiator games, right? It's, it's when you talk about football, or especially something like football, which is a very violent sport. And I, I have to admit, I am a football fan, but I, 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 and I do get the irony of being a highly sensitive man who's not for violent things, but who has been socialized and grown up to believe that, that watching football is a good thing to do. Um, I, I, I see that. Uh, and so much of the, the the athletes we have is that they're sort of projecting out that warrior mentality. And that goes back to even, I guess, to the days of Sparta. Um, and, uh, you know, that when you go on the battlefield, you don't leave anything behind. You lay it all out there. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the consequences are not the same today, but yet we still have the mentality that they are. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. No, that was that was good. I um. So you're on the same page with me on tracing, you know, learning and pressure from the higher ups from Sparta to the military through the modern people. And I would say the same thing if you went to Oklahoma on a farm in the 1880s. I think you'd see the same thing from the father or the grandfather or the uncle, whoever was in charge of that that group of people on the farm. They've yeah. got the hay that they've got to get in, the corn that they've got to get in, the animals that have to be moved, and they have to do everything precisely so that they can operate with the weather, the birthing of the uh, the, the children of those animals, the their own wives' birth or difficulty in birth. Everything at certain po points of the day or the month have to happen with, with Swiss clock efficacy, otherwise they could fail. And if a farm fails, what do you do then? You, you know, you become uh, at, the, at the best scenario, a sharecropper on someone else's land because your land's no longer, you can't afford it. Or right. you become a, a wrangler, you know, dad or brothers have to leave and become, become a wandering itinerant worker, cowboy wrangler for somebody else. And if that, if you don't find people who will hire you, let's say you're 50 and, and, 30 was considered old in, in, you know, in the 1850s or 1880s, you know, you, what are you going to do? And so this this idea of survival that predominates a lot of the decision-making uh, the women want to find the, the one who is the provider uh, many times in our, in our history, homo sapien history. 
this is the one who can provide because I don't want to be destitute with these kids and sometimes sick kids and a sick mother of, of the wife. And so they want to find that provider, but providers aren't always not disabled. Sometimes the provider has, like my athletes that I've interviewed, they may have a, a disability or two or three, or they may have a psychological right. breakdown. Now, what do you do? And so these are the challenges that, that we have as humans. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, yeah, and I don't want to minimize in any way the fact that life 150 years ago was nothing like what we live today. I mean, it, especially if you're talking about those people who went out west and settled. Uh, I've actually, uh, you know, been uh, a, a, an area on the Oregon Trail. There was a there's a really neat museum in eastern Oregon, uh, right about the Idaho border. I think it's in Baker. And it is a, sort of a diorama of all the life was like for those pioneers who came out on the Oregon Trail. And that was not easy. I mean, the idea that they packed their entire lives into these wagons um, and looking out uh, from the museum, you can still see the wagon trail ruts in the, in the ground from where they had come in the past. So. It was a much different life back then. It was much more physical, as you said, required more physicality. And decisions had life and death consequences. You know, if you didn't do something right, you didn't pro uh, plant your crops at the right time, uh, you didn't eat. Uh, if a, a dust storm came and uh, d destroyed your crops, and then, again, you're, you're fighting nature and you're fighting uh, some of maybe even your own worst fears. Uh, in, a, in a kind of a life and death battle to survive. We've got so much easier now than we did back then. Although I think sometimes we still feel as though we live in that time frame, um, and and maybe even make decisions as if we did. But uh, yeah, I would hate to anybody to walk away thinking I'm not uh, I'm not giving due credit to those people who had to to do, to live that tough life and going back in history as well. You know. I um I have uh, a number of more things for a potential second interview if you'd be open to it. One would be a checklist of HSP traits and and you know what are the steps that you take if you if you have this and you want to learn more. Maybe oh, if you're open to it, we could do one on that. Sure, absolutely. Be glad to do that. And then if you or another contact of yours might be open to it, I'm looking for someone that has really good interpersonal skills as you do. Uh, that has a sense of history and sociology and psychology uh, to interview me about my three books, Sedentary Nation, The Aging Athlete, and then my third book, which I haven't released yet, called Are You Raising a Child Athlete? Things You Need to Know. So right. um, maybe you can think about that and we'll, we'll come. Yeah, uh, let me give it some thought. I, I've done a, a, quite a few, Not certainly haven't done as many interviews as you have racked up here. Uh, but I've done enough and, and had a chance to see a lot of different people. And um, well, let me think about that. I'll, I'll get back to you on it. Sure. So um, I'm going to share my uh, website and anything that I need to reach out for. And I'm, you're welcome to do that. And then we could sign off. So um, I'm Sifu Slem, uh, author of a number of books, also coaching people on fitness, wellness, and lifestyle, um, empathetic HSP very physically oriented, uh, very dietarily oriented, uh, you know, take a nap every day. So I'm hoping to bring some of my wellness traits uh, and, and gifts uh, over to you. If you are a person who needs some of that, you can reach me through my website, theagingathlete.com. And I'm always looking for more athletes and experts of a variety of fields to interview people who've written books, people who have spent some time on a certain topic, Love to interview them. So if you have any contacts or friends, family members, please reach out through my website and maybe we could set up an interview with me and that person. Now over to Bill. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just give you my little pitch too. I uh, uh, I have two books that are out there. One is called uh, Confessions of a Sensitive Man, which is kind of the story of my life and how I came to uh, terms with being a sensitive man. Uh, the other one is on becoming a, a sensitive man and on becoming a sensitive man will be an online course here. Hopefully it will be up 
uh, this summer. Um, and it will have, uh, you know, sort of lecture format. I'll have uh, interviews with some experts uh, that I've selected that would help uh, with people who are discovering the trade of high sensitivity and uh, for men. Uh, you can come to my website. It's thesensitiveman.com. Um, I've got blogs out there. I've got uh, other podcast interviews. Uh, I've also got uh, a lot of stuff uh, in terms of activities and links and references and so forth. It's a good resource for highly sensitive men. And if you're interested and you think that you're a highly sensitive man and would like to join with other highly sensitive men, I have an online group that meets once a month and you can go to the website, get the details and find out how to contact me from there. But that's that's uh, kind of my thing right now. Thanks, Bill. Maybe you could uh, send me a link to that and I'll put it under the video on YouTube sure. and then people would have that as a resource. Um, thanks so much for today, Bill. Um, I'm going to run out and, and I'll send you an email. And maybe we can regroup in the upcoming weeks about uh, some of the things that I wanted to flesh out in a little bit more detail, like a checklist of AH HSP and some of these types of things. That'd be, that'd be great, Sifu. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Bill. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, Please like and subscribe, people, and leave your comments below, and we'll try to get back to you. Take care.